English panel of the data leaders within uh, four of our financial regulatory agencies, and specifically to our coalition senior policy advisor, Adam Glass. Adam is a former chief counsel of the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the SEC, so he knows of what he speaks, and I'll leave it to him to introduce our panelists, and organize their comments, and call for more audience questions. Adam. Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning, which is an ungodly early hour for at least some of you. Um, I can't help but stir the pot a little bit before I uh, introduce the panel, uh, because I happen to know from when I was at the SEC that the SEC has a complete and quality database of all credit default swaps, including index-based swaps. So in theory, that could be shared with the CFTC, but uh, maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, you all know the names of the panelists, so I'm just going to ask each one, starting with Srini and working up the way down, to take three to five minutes uh, talking about uh, what the remit, the job of their agency is, and uh, perhaps how, they, how they're using structured data uh, in that agency. Good morning. Um, um, thank you, Adam. I'm Srini Bangala. I'm Chief Data Officer for uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And as you, most of you might uh, already know, the CFTC is tasked with overseeing uh, the futures options in the swaps market. Um, um, we had we got additional authority in uh, 2010 through the Dodd-Frank Act to uh, oversee the swaps market, which is basically a majority of our focus right now. Um, where I am situated, my office was created uh, under the IT group in 2011. Uh, so it was October of 2011 that I deserted the SEC and joined the CFTC. And uh, I've been setting up the, the data function in the CFTC. Uh, primarily, we are right now focused on ensuring that there is standards and guidance for the swap state reporting and internally that there is enough um, quality data for our staff to use. Uh, now, these are very simple and cliche terms to use, but it encompasses a, an entire ecosystem of data and users and, and reporters uh, for this data and swap data repositories. Uh, so it is a, an extraordinarily complicated um, system of interconnection between all the parties. And um, under you know, uh, uh, Commissioner Manning's leadership on the TAC, we've been pursuing a number of uh, uh, initiatives uh, in, in ensuring their standardization and their harmonization of data. Uh, on an ongoing basis, we're also focused on ensuring that as the rules get written, we are in front of the rules and we can publish these standards and other rules. We have done that for a couple of rules. We need to do that for all the rules. Um, so, which is where we are now. And as we talk, I think you'll learn more about uh, you know the other things that the, the commission is doing. Thank you. Uh, next is Scott Bacchus, uh, Deputy Director of the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the SEC. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, I've been an economist now at the SEC for about uh, seven years. Uh, I hold my position to the man sitting to my right, Jonathan Zuckoban, so thank you for hiring me. Um, I also previously occupied the job that I currently have. Uh, Matt Reed to uh, the right is uh, somebody that worked on my very first initiative when I came to the commission. It was called XBRL. Uh, I was the economist uh, that was tagged with, um, no pun intended, doing the costs and benefits uh, of those rules, both the 2008 proposing release and the 2009 adopting release. And so uh, I've worked uh, continuously uh, on those initiatives uh, since the inception. And Srini to uh, my left here, I've actually worked on other data initiatives, uh, structured data initiatives with, and that was a tips, complaints, and referral system following the uh, made off uh, debacle and the financial crisis. So the commission undertook a, a very large structured data initiative to make that information coming into the commission uh, usable. Uh, and those initiatives continue, and that's, uh, I think, uh, generate a lot of success in the programs that we have here. And so, um, at a, or excuse me, Matt Reed's uh, office, um, uh, formerly worked with the Office of Interactive Data, it is now an office in DIRA. Many, some of the members that were in that original office from seven years ago still exist. 
Uh, we uh, maintain an active interest in uh, XBRL, but not only XBRL, but all structured data, XML, FPML, uh, pipe delimited uh, to an economist and to our division. How the data is structured is far less important than what information is being structured. And so XBRL is just one way uh, to do that. We also have an office of quantitative research uh, that is working very closely with data that comes in from SROs, FINRA, Form ADB, and other information, making sure that data that comes in is structured and usable by the commission, uh, as Adam uh, mentioned. Uh, we also have been working for several years now with the DTCC Trade Information Warehouse under the OTC Through with Regular Reform Agreement to take information that comes in on security-based swaps which is structured currently in making that usable to the commission. Um, and you know, fortunately for us, uh, unlike the CFTC, the, the uh, swaps that we regulate, uh, for the most part, are being governed by one swap data repository. Uh, that could, of course, change in the future. And so some of our initial uh, problems, uh, you know, I don't think are the same scope and magnitude of what the CFTC's had. Uh, so let me just stop there and pass it over. Jonathan Coburn is, I guess, chief economist at, not a little bit, at uh, FINRA, which is the former NASD, um, both a member or, membership organization of broker dealers uh, and also a regulatory body uh, under uh, delegated authority from the SEC. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, FINRA and, and the use of data? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the coalition for the opportunity to join you this morning. Uh, as you will hear, not only am I a former colleague of uh, Scott's at the SEC, I'm a former colleague of Matt's at the OFR. So I guess uh, I think Commissioner right. O'Malley is gone, but uh, I haven't quite collected the whole set. Uh, it's a it's a it's a goal. Um, so I figure you know a little bit less about the, the work that FINRA does than the other agencies here, and I thought I'd take a second and, and give you a little bit of a sense of who we are, what we do, and what our role in large data and analytics is. So let me start with who we are. FINRA is the largest independent regulator of securities firms doing business with the public in the United States. There are about 4,100 broker-dealers in the United States 160,000 branch offices and almost 636,000 individual registered reps in the United States. Our core mission is to pursue investor protection and market integrity. And we do this through an effective private-public partnership in regulation. We promulgate our own rules, we supervise, surveil, and uh, examine, and monitor for um, compliance with those rules and we bring enforcement actions when we see violations of those rules. We do this under congressional mandate and as Adam said we are overseen by the SEC. So what is it that we do? Um, we do many things but I'm going to talk about three of them particularly here. Uh, three areas of focus for us is oversight of members, market participants, we have market oversight and we play a, a significant role in data transparency around key markets in the US. Let me talk about each of those in turn. So let's talk about member oversight. We're responsible for ensuring fair treatment of customers through things like our suitability rule, ensuring that customers sell clients investments that are suitable for who they are, their investment objectives, the risk that they want to take, where they are in their life cycle. We focus on issues like funding and liquidity of firms. So we've got not only a relationship with the SEC, but we work with the Fed as well because safety and soundness is part of our responsibility. We're concerned with issues like AML, like cybersecurity, and um, even things like conflicts of interest that arise out of a broker-dealer's business. Last year, for instance, we launched a high-risk broker initiative to identify brokers who have a pattern of complaints or disclosures for sales practice abuses, and we expedited enforcement against those, uh, those brokers. Turning now to market oversight, FINRA provides cross-market surveillance for almost all equity markets in the United States. We surveil not only for our own rules, I should have said this earlier, but we also surveil under delegated authority for SEC rules, federal securities laws, and for uh, MSRB rules as well. The surveillance, we, um, we have contracts with all of the major exchanges, 
we recently signed a, a contract with BATS to include their four exchanges within our environment. They will come online in the first quarter of 2015. At that point, we will collect data and surveil for 99% of listed equity securities in the United States. We also surveil in the same way for um, fixed income and, and securities derivatives, although we have a less complete view of those markets. So what is this surveillance? We bring in through the order audit trail system or the OAT system from our members who report to us, plus the information that we get from the exchanges, between 15 and 20 billion activities a day. We bring in six terabytes of data and we create from the data, combining the OATS and, and the order trail data coming from the exchanges, a cross-market model. We then run patterns against that model. And there are, these patterns are designed to detect activities like layering and spoofing, algorithmic gaming, wash sales, marking the open and close, front running, and a variety of trading abuses. When we find those, those red flags in our data, we then investigate, we can bring actions ourselves, we can bring actions in conjunction with the SEC, or we can refer to the SEC if appropriate. Data transparency is something that I'm not sure that you guys uh, know much about in our role in it. FINRA provides the authoritative source for post-trade transparency for a significant portion of fixed income in the United States. So since 2002, we've been collecting and disseminating for public use trades that occur in corporate securities. It was, it's been rolled out over time, so there was a, um, a period where it got phased in, but for all, secure, all uh, corporate transactions in the United States, FINRA provides post-trade transparency. Since 2012, we've provided transparency in the TBA market and other ABS securities, and in 2013, we added other structured derivative securities. FINRA has also recently published rules that would permit us to make public transactions in uh, 144A transactions as well. So what's interesting about this is that this is an obligation that accrues to our member firms. They must report their transactions that they, that they do either on their own behalf or on behalf of clients within 15 minutes. As soon as we get that trade within our system, it is then put out to a tape. We provide the information to professionals at a very de minimis cost, and for non-professionals, including academics, the information is free. Trading history is free. We believe that by creating that transparency around those markets, we are in fact pursuing our goal of protecting investors better and strengthening markets. Let me turn quickly to technology. A former colleague of ours um, made an impression on, on me greatly when she used to say, Dessa Glasser, who was at the OFR, you know, that industry understands that data is an asset. That there has been a transformation in the way that business uses, the business of financial intermediation uses data that it collects and stores. I think the thing that I want to impress upon you is that we as a regulatory body understand that as well. That data is our biggest asset. And in fact, the, um, the, the, the great leap that has occurred in particularly big data technology and the ability to, to apply analytics against the big data has been a game changer for regulators. We believe strongly at FINRA that the future of regulation, of oversight and of surveillance is about levering <coughs> data and risk analytics. So to that point, we really, I want to point to two really important initiatives that we're involved in. One is actually something that, that the SEC mandated for us to get involved in, and that is the Consolidated Audit Trail, or CAT. The SEC mandated that, the, uh, that FINRA and the exchanges, as, as the self-regulatory organizations, come up with a national market plan to create a single point of, of uh, collection for all information regarding um, orders and trades that occur in listed securities in the United States. So this means that there'll be a consolidated view for the um, for orders and as they're executed and routed through the many places that they can execute in the United States, from order to execution. 
and it will give regulators, individual SROs, FINRA as this cross-market monitor, and the SEC itself, a very complete view of what's going on at an order level. In a similar way, FINRA has recently proposed something that we call CARDS. This is an effort to collect complete and um, standardized data from the broker-dealers themselves at the account level. So it's the, it's the positions in the accounts, and also importantly, information about the characteristics of the account holder. There will be no private information, no tax ID, no name, no social security associated with it. But we're going to be collecting information about the accounts, this is, so it's post-execution, and this information will allow us to understand, as Commissioner Pivovar said, trends and outliers in the holdings at the broker, at the branch, and at the broker-dealer level, which will allow us to do a much stronger job and be, um, and be a, a more effective regulator. Last comment, I know I've used more than my time. Um, when you deal with these issues about data, big data particularly, the issues of data security, about the, the breadth of the data that you collect as a regulator become critical. We understand our goal is to get to an ask once kind of situation. This has got to be win-win not only for the regulator, for, for the protection of individuals, but it has to be a win for, for the industry as well. It's got to be something that levers information smartly and ultimately allows much more focused and effective conversation about the risks that exist within the firms that we examine and supervise. Matt Reed, uh, the Chief Counsel of the Office of Financial Research and my former colleague of mine from the SEC. Uh, please uh, go ahead and tell us about your, your organization. Great. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Hudson, and the Coalition for having us here. Um, so my name is Matt Reed. As you might have heard, I used to work at the SEC. And uh, Mike Pivovar mentioned Chris Cox, and that's how I got into this um, uh, area of data and standards. Uh, the, um, yeah, the, the chairman at the time launched the XBRR program and later the 21st Century Disclosure Initiative. Um, and from my perspective, these were the, the elements that uh, helped make sense of just an avalanche of data that was coming into the commission. And, and I'm a firm believer that there's no other way uh, to approach regulation in the future than without uh, good, structured, standardized data. So the OFR uh, came into existence after the Dodd-Frank Act, Act, or through the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, it serves the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is a council of regulators charged with monitoring the broad financial system, not just particular segments of it, but the entire financial system for market instability. My office, the OFR, uh, serves the council in three basic ways. One, uh, it collects data from across the regulatory environment and from uh, firms. Uh, that relates to financial stability or instability or risk to financial stability. Uh, the second thing that we do is perform research and analysis on those data. And then the final thing is to facilitate the development of standards to improve the quality and the scope of the data uh, that are necessary to analyze financial stability. And it's that last piece that brings the other hat that I wear. Um, our big financial uh, standards initiative right now is a foundational one, and it's called the Legal Entity Identifier. What we have done together with other regulators here in the United States, in particular the CFTC with Srini, uh, and regulators and uh, finance, finance ministers and central bankers all over the world, is uh, identify and develop the need for a ubiquitous global standard for the identification of financial market participants anywhere in the world. So what we've done is we've identified um, an ISO standard. We've developed it through ISO. It's 20 characters, alphanumeric. We can go into the details if you like. Um, the, uh, the identifier uh, will be assigned to anybody participating in financial market transactions anywhere in the world. And the goal is that all of us, as regulators here in the United States and abroad, and market participants will be able to use the single point of identification for any firm. So there's no more question about whether when you're talking about uh, uh, First Bank of California, you're talking about the same First Bank um, uh, located in Los Angeles as opposed to the one up in San Francisco or some other derivative of that name somewhere else in the United States. 
we developed a three-tiered governance structure for this legal entity identifier. At the top is a committee composed of 60 authorities from 30 countries. I'm the chairman of that committee. Um, underneath that is a private sector uh, foundation that will be located in Switzerland composed of uh, a number of private individuals who will manage the operational governance of the system. Uh, there are three people here in the audience that have been chosen to be the board. One of them, I think, is going to leave because they have a meeting at 9, and so you're excused, Chris, and so are the others. Um, and what they're trying to do is put together um, a, uh, a, the, the manner in which they will weave this system together. The bottom level of the system are, right now, uh, 12 registries around the country, around the world, rather. One in the United States, and I think the others are basically in Europe. There might be one in India now. I can't remember if they're allowed to. What department? There are 13. There are 13. I stand corrected. These registries uh, have assigned about 250,000 codes so far against the same exact standard. Um, uh, allowing for six or nine pieces of reference data associated with that code. It depends on, on how you look at it, whether it's six or nine. Um, all against a common template. Um, we've issued a common data format. People will be building that reference data to the common data format. And the key thing about these uh, 13 registries and the 250,000 codes that have been issued thus far is any authority in the world that's a member of our committee is expected to recognize these codes wherever they come from for regulatory reporting. So in the case of the CFTC, they have a live swaps rule. They report a swap uh, to a CSDC supervised swaps data repository. You must get a legal entity identifier to identify you and your counterparty. And you can get that identifier from the US or you can go to Europe to any of these registries over there and get the same identifier and use it for reporting in the United States. And this is a very important moment uh, uh, in, in uh, regulation because it, it presents uh, a, uh, an example of a public-private global partnership centered solely around uh, improving the quality of data, uh, data for financial regulation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific initiative. We've got meetings in Washington this week. The board of directors is meeting today and then tomorrow. Uh, 23 members of the executive committee are flying into town to, to host our, our executive committee meetings. Um, and the system is really up and fully operational already, but it will be uh, completely launched by, uh, by the middle of the summer. Okay, so I think now I will, uh, I'm going to pose some questions and then we'll have time for audience questions. And I actually want to work back down so we can stick with that. Um, when, will, uh, when will the fully uh, developed LEI with all the governance issues worked out and the foundation set up uh, so that uh, it is as fully developed as possible, ready for prime time? Uh, what's, what's the schedule on which that will occur? Well, I think it's ready for prime time now. Uh, it, it's uh, being used in live reporting rules, which means that the official sector is basing uh, their reporting on this identifier from these 250,000 entities that are already reporting using the identifier. So I think it's ready for prime time now. Um, what, when it will be kind of fully op, uh, operational and, and complete uh, is never. Uh, and that's because uh, we expect this to prol proliferate if, if we have our way, uh, what will ultimately occur is the barcode effect. Uh, so Tim Smucker, who is uh, the former chairman of GS1, which does the barcode, is on our board um, and is helping to uh, steer this toward some sort of a barcode effect type. Uh, result where um, it, it wouldn't make sense to do business in global financial markets if you didn't have a barcode. So that's the end state for us, but that never ends, as you can imagine. Um, but the steps in between, uh, we'll have a foundation uh, formalized. Uh, it's a matter of filing legal documents. This summer, the board will formally take control as the year passes on. And so the handoff will be sometime later this year from my body, the Regulatory Oversight Committee, to this private sector board of directors. Uh, and then they'll be given the operational control that um, will continue to supervise for to ensure that this public good remains a public good. But I think that's really the timetable. The next six months, uh, the final handover of operations. But um, this is an evergreen project, Evan. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, do you, uh, are you collecting LEIs now, and will you be uh, further on? Not you personally. Because <laughs> right. I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, so FINRA, 
certainly <coughs> contemplates in certain instances that the LEI is a very useful indicator. Right now, our systems are really surrounding or, or really based on a, a, an MPID, a market participant ID. And part of the difficulty, is, and Matt knows this, is that in different instances, the ID reflects um, a different element or different part of a legal entity. In many cases, the MPID doesn't reflect um, an entity per se. So you can take a large house like um, Goldman Sachs, who may have a single MPID that they use both for their own trading and the trading that, that occurs on their, um, on their ATS, Sigma X. Um, so let me just cut you off there. Um, I can appreciate that the, uh, that the LEI is a legal entity standard, uh, and in general it will not respect the divisions. I think there's an exception for foreign branches of U.S. banks and vice versa. Um, even though you have more granular disclosures, it seems to me that you could uh, ask for the LEI to be added into that for whoever the legal entity would be for that smaller, and that that would make... Uh, matching your data up with other databases easier. And there are other instances like the CAT rules that, have, that permit us to contemplate that. So it's, well, a, we collect ADV and PF on behalf of the SEC. So we're, we're just a processor of those data and those data actually do, I think, have, have space for the other okay. as well. Thank you. Um, Scott, uh, I, I wanted to ask, jump off the LEI you know, for many months, it was my favorite topic. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, this hurt bill that's been discussed, which uh, would uh, eliminate, uh, basically would be an exemption for any uh, company with 250 million or less in revenue uh, that would last to the later of um, uh, three years, or I believe it's the SEC putting out a cost benefit analysis that shows the positive net benefit. Um, how would that affect the ability of the SEC and outside consumers? Um, to use XBRL if we take out 61% uh, of the violent population. Well, so, yeah, push, the yellow, push the button when the light goes off. Okay. All right, that works better. Uh, so, so our estimates uh, of the herd bill in 15 million in revenue, I think is similar to what's been kind of uh, discussed in uh, DTC and others that upwards of 60% uh, of the filer population would no longer file an XBRL. Um, what we knew before 2009 is that about one third of all filers did not have coverage by data aggregators, and that's really the mechanism by which uh, all the tools, software tools that you use for analyzing companies uh, takes place. And the reason is institutional investors don't want to don't care about smaller companies because a hundred million dollar market cap is not big enough for them to invest in. So. By default, data aggregators then don't collect that data because that's not part of their revenue model. Uh, XBRL allowed that, uh, you know, those companies to get coverage, uh, and data aggregators now include that information in their databases because it's low cost to do so. If you if you exempt 61% or 60% of the filers, then it's likely that you go back to the pre-2009 era in which a lot of the data is not available to be sold, uh, and so therefore be less likely to be used. Um, and so there's, uh, I think the DTC has uh, published, you know, their thoughts on, you know, what effects, uh, what knock-on effects there might be of this. I'll just point out one additional thing that's not often discussed, but it's very important to the SEC, and that is we have regular, we have a Regulation Flexibility Act requirement, which is to assess the impact of all of our rules uh, on small reporting companies. And because XRail has now been phased in um, fully uh, for all the entire population of uh, filers. Uh, we're actually able to do analysis on smaller companies that we couldn't previously do. Uh, and that's in, for example, assessing the impact of a hurt bill was not made possible because of experimental data. Uh, three years ago, we would not have been able to make that estimate. Poetic it's, justice. What's that? <laughs> it's poetic justice. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the, the broader point is that, you know, the, this cost savings smaller companies get by not reporting XPRL will be offset by potential benefits that you know we could have in making more efficacious rules. And let me retroactively say that that view is uh, my own view and not that of the commission or any of my colleagues on the staff. I could 
I feel the pressure around here from my former colleagues. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, now I'm going to throw something out to all the panelists uh, by starting with Srini. And um, in um, uh, being at the Data Coalition right, since November 2013, uh, it's been quite interesting because I've gotten acquainted with some of the history of the FEC. For example, that the Edgar uh, history. <laughs> the Edgar database, which uh, everyone who is uh, an, an investor in, uh, in uh, uh, public companies in the U.S. Uh, uses all the time, it's the fundamental repository for, uh, for corporate filings, 10K, 10Q, and securities listings. Um, but it's in HTML, um, the, the, the part that uh, the industry relies on, so it's not uh, fully utilized. Um, I, I uh, learned that that website was only made free and public because an open data advocate, Carl Malibu, uh, bought the data um, and got a license and then put it up on a computer uh, and offered it free for a year and then shut it down. That is why we have public Edgar uh, today. Uh, the SEC thought it was just going to be you know, for internal use. Um, so I, I wanted to, uh, another aspect of, of being at the Data Transparency Coalition, I meet a lot of uh, old timers, even older than, than me, at least in doing this. Um, but I must be uh, having in mind that uh, my, my 60th birthday was last week, so happy, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of these guys that I met uh, is a, a quant uh, with uh, administration experience, Mark Foreman, and he mentioned when we were talking to him about implementation of the Data Act, because there will be a lot to do for implementation after it passes, that typically you don't get opposition from an agency by the people who are at the lowest level, you know, the, the true worker bees. Because if you, if you bring data and automation, that makes their job easier. Then you have a level of, I don't know, two or five layers of, of middle management too many of which are instinctive naysayers because they don't have a profit motive, so then the motive becomes risk avoidance. And then you get up to the commissioners that are not as bought into the agency culture because they haven't been there as long, political appointees. They're often forward thinking, as you probably, probably got the impression from the speaks by Commissioner O'Malley and, uh, and Mike Pivovar um, just now. Uh, but the, the message never makes its way up from the people on the bottom through all those layers of naysayers to the people at the top, kind of a sandwich effect. So what I want to ask uh, all of the panelists, but starting with Srini, uh, do you see that kind of effect uh, at your agency? Um, I think fortunately the CFTC is a big, bit small enough not to have too much of that effect. And I think uh, um, it used to be a much smaller agency and we've grown in the last couple of years hopefully we'll grow further because there's so much work that we can't get it accomplished in our lifetimes. Um, it's not as pronounced. Um, I, would, um, I would phrase it slightly different, uh, differently in the, uh, the CFTC as I have seen. It's not necessarily that the layers of management have uh, um, a resistance. I think it's more of a, a culture of if you write a rule, then the market participants should know what to report, kind of culture, as opposed to if you write a rule, do the market participants know enough to report quality data to us so we can use it? So we have you know, the users clamoring for good quality data, users meaning our economists, our surveillance analysts, um, you know, our enforcement folks. We have, you know, of course, the data and the IT folks clamoring for good quality of data and standards. We have commissioners clamoring for good quality of data and standards and use of data in an effective manner. And I think we have, uh, in some ways, a lot of the rule writers clamoring for the same thing, but I think they need to be led uh, because they don't always know what the path is. Yes, and I have, to, I have to say that it's not been a very difficult thing to convince them of the need it's been more of an issue of uh, resources for us. Uh, so, so let me then uh, uh, ask uh, Scott the same question, but also answering perhaps um, along the lines of, uh, is there a chief data officer at the SEC? Is there any single person whose job it is to push or lead the, F the SEC in the transformation that Hudson mentioned from old-fashioned disconnected documents to interactive structured data? 
I think slide war rules actually still work fairly well. <laughs> <laughs> so do pencils. Uh, I think I'm being set up a little bit with this question, but uh, we have a, a chief information officer, Tom Baer, uh, who understands the IT infrastructure resources required for uh, uh, structured data. Uh, in DIRA, the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, we have two offices dedicated to working uh, with structured data initiatives, either taking data in that we currently get from various sources, commercial data, SROs, as well as uh, an office, as previously mentioned, and some of the staff I can see you're in the room here from the Office of Interactive Data that works with forms and filings and to make them better. So just broadly speaking, uh, I mean, the, uh, the chair is committed to a culture of smart disclosure. Um, I think it's shared broadly from the commission, even though sometimes I think people from the outside don't think that's true. Uh, to some extent, it's somewhat unfortunate that XPRL came out uh, for financial reporting in January of 2009 during the height of the financial crisis and the Dodd-Frank Act and Jobs Act, you know, uh, followed thereafter. And so there are competing priorities for a number of uh, really good initiatives. and. Uh, there's still a, a burning fire inside the SEC with dedicated staff on structured data initiatives. And it is something that in every rule that comes up, uh, we consider carefully, you know, how can we structure these forms, not just in collecting financial data, uh, making that available to the public, but understanding, you know, how we should collect it to make that data most uh, usable. So just one point is that a data formats and schema is only one element to providing good structured data. There's a lot of thought that needs to go into what information you collect when you get away from numbers and go to narrative disclosures. Uh, how do you make that transition? And even reporting numbers by themselves, if they're not standardized across uh, filers, isn't very usable. And so it's not as simple as turning on a switch. There's a lot of effort that goes in to making structured data usable. And so we carefully think about each of those initiatives as they come up. Uh, thank you. And uh, now, actually, uh, Jonathan and Matt are going to be let off the hook because uh, we're going to audience questions. I have a lot more questions, so if the audience is shy, you'll get your turn. Just for the record, we don't have that problem because this is what we're supposed to do. Yeah, that, and that's a good thing. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. All right, Greg Sisler from Merrill Corporation. Uh, and just to anybody on the panel, it seems that intuitively that the HR bill that's uh, that was passed by the Finance Committee last week is going to be harmful to smaller companies because their data is going to be less available and, and you cited some reasons already, but I wonder, is there anything quantitatively that can be stated to sort of in opposition to this bill that can demonstrate the <coughs> usefulness of the smaller companies participating in XBRL and sharing their data that way? It's common sense and it's intuitive that it's a good thing, but is there any way to demonstrate that? Uh, I think Commissioner Pilmar's earlier remarks on it'd be great if we could get uh, concrete examples of how this information is being used. That's something that we need to do. And it's broadly speaking, if you're a small issuer, it's very easy to see the expense of complying with the rules. It's much harder to uh, see the benefits or anticipate the benefits of how it might affect capital formation. And so to some extent, if you know, you're know you focusing on products innovation in your company, you know what the cash outlay is, whether it's $20,000 or $25,000 for you to do this. You don't know how investors are using it or how analysts are using it. And so that's something that we need more concrete evidence and not just the theoretical um, basis for why we should have this. We'll take three more questions. I'd like to ask all the remaining questioners to address just one panelist for the sake of time. Hey, uh, Kevin Davis, Find the Best. Uh, this is primarily for Jonathan. Uh, you're lucky for that one. Uh, find the Best is a website that uses data to help consumers uh, by making it understandable. Um, recently, some of this data that we've been able to put on the site has been made available by the SEC with regards to registered investment advisors and their representatives on that in a daily compilation. And what are Finder's plans to do this similar, something similar for broker dealers and their representatives so that individuals and private companies can take that, that data either in bulk or through some daily compilation and put it out there to the public, make it more valuable. So I don't know what data about investment advisors is being made public, but what I can tell you is that, for instance, BrokerCheck, which has got a ton of information about 
brokers' histories um, and, and, and their experiences already available. We make a, a, a fair bit of data, of data available online and through, as I said, our transparency data is available to bulk resellers at, at a minimal cost. So I think we are very active in trying to provide markets with a broader range of data that we think will help the, uh, the investor understand not only what the true value of a, of a transaction should be, but also about the history of the individuals who participate in the market so that they can make better informed choices. Can, can I ask the questioner, uh, what are the obstacles now to getting the data that you think uh, would be removed by FINRA being more like the SEC when FINRA ma makes broker-dealer data? available as a compilation. Uh, yeah, sure. Broker Check's a great tool, but requires us to go onto the FINRA website and use it kind of individually, broker by broker. Um, you know, we, as a private company, we're looking to ingest data and kind of put it into our own platform and use structured data in, in aggregate to kind of provide more insights to our users when they're thinking about their financial decisions. Um, so just allowing us to have more control over transforming it, displaying it, and utilizing our platform and technology to kind of take it where we want to go with it. Let's do two more questions, but uh, feel free to mill about afterwards and meet the panelists. Hi, uh, Tim Lee with uh, FI Consulting, and I've heard a little, uh, I've heard quite a bit actually about how the folks on the public service side want to, you know, want to make use of all this data, how, uh, you know, the value for, the value for the government. What I, what I'm interested in, I guess this is as much to the rest of the audience as, uh, as to the panelists. I know that putting out the railroads, for example, to give a historical example, led to, led to um, the rise of companies like Sears Roebuck. The printing press led, um, you know, led, has been argued, to democracy. We put, this data, we put this data out there in the public format, and I hear it being talked about as, as an asset. What, what does that mean for the entrepreneurial folks on on the private sector side, on, on the civilian side, what you know, what's what's the dream about what what this data makes possible? I, I think that's something that's um, you know, that's very um, you know very important to you know to be aware of as well. And I, I think something that's probably you know perhaps a few steps down the line, but um, important to start thinking about. You know, I think. That's a very important area of focus, and I'm sure Scott, when he does his cost-benefit analysis, looks at, you know, I mean, those are the very things that rule writers are supposed to look at. What are the, what are the benefits both to the government, but, but also more, uh, more, more broadly uh, to the public when we do these initiatives. I can tell you that on the legal entity identifier initiative, the very reason we chose a public-private partnership is because we want to make the standard valuable to industry uh, and to, uh, to the markets. So, so we went to a private industry standard setting organization to create the standard so that they could build it in a way that they could use in their systems, not just government systems. We've created a board of directors of private individuals so that they can operationalize this system uh, in a way that will serve them and not just the regulators. Now we oversee it to make sure it also meets our needs, but we think that's a critical component to get the pull on the other end. We can push through regulation, but if all you do is push and there's no pull, then you're just gonna have a bolt-on reporting requirement using the LEI. We wanna get this LEI sucked into the systems of these, of these um, of these banks and of these brokers and so forth, so that it becomes embedded throughout their value chain. And then we want them pushing it out to their suppliers. And, and so that's that's the approach that we've taken. There's an article, I think the number's overstated, but there's an article by somebody named Alistair Milne, um, somewhere in maybe Oxford, um, uh, who estimated the potential savings to banks and other financial market participants of the LEI of potentially $10 billion per year. Again, I think that's a big number, so I don't, I don't take credit for it. I point to him, but um, I, you know, e even if it was a fraction of that, um, that would just be an enormous benefit because of all the efficiencies it, it, it creates. So I think that's a that's a good thing to be focused on. And we're out of time. Uh, in a minute, don't hold your applause. I'd like to ask you to thank all the panelists, but I just wanted to uh, announce that. Uh, just as our coalition is pursuing structured data in financial regulatory reporting, as many of you know, we're pursuing the same campaign for the U.S. government's own spending. Uh, we're excited to see congressional action on the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act, or DATA Act, uh, which will require the U.S. Treasury 
to establish government-wide data standards for all spending. That's financial reporting, budget action reporting, grant reporting, contract reporting. We're expecting congressional action on the Data Act very soon. And I'm excited to announce this morning